what I can tell you about are the Fenians. Yeah. Um, the IRB. Um, I'm going to tell you what. The funeral. He joins the IRB at the age of 18, which mm-hmm. is, you know, very young age. Mm-hmm. Uh, just make sure everything's recording. Yeah. Um, <coughs> what sort of state was that in when he joined? When John Devoy joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Irish Republican Brotherhood is really the most important revolutionary movement within Ireland. The IRB is a secret, outbound revolutionary conspiracy that had been established in 1858, and the ambition of the IRB was to lead a revolution within Ireland. The IRB argued that the only way to achieve Irish independence was to overthrow British rule. They argued that the British government would never understand anything unless it was violence or the threat of violence. That's essentially what they had to do. When Devoy joined the movement, Devoy joined the movement because he wanted to be part of a revolution. John Devoy had been brought up on his family's revolutionary antecedents. He'd been brought up in stories of 1798 and stories of 1848. At, the, at a young age, when he was a child in school, he received a beating. He received a beating that nearly killed him on the basis that he refused to stand for the British national anthem, God Save the King. Now, one of the first things that John Devoy does when he joins the IRB is to join the French Foreign Legion. He joins the French Foreign Legion on the basis that he wants to see service, he wants to see training and preparation for the forthcoming rebellion. And he believes that one of the best armies that he could join was the Foreign Legion. And while in the Foreign Legion, he serves in North Africa, where he learns very valuable trades in warfare and fighting. The IRB is a huge organisation in the 1860s. It stretches all across Ireland. Now, its membership would include a lot of working class figures. You'd have a lot of soldiers, you'd have a lot of shopkeepers, you'd also have school teachers and you'd have academics. And you also have the son of clergymen as well, who will be involved in the Irish Republican Brotherhood. The movement really bestrode Irish history in this period like a colossus. It is in every single community and rural area within Ireland. But really the birthplace of the Irish Republican Brotherhood is in West Cork. West Cork is the crucible of Fenianism. While the Irish Republican Brotherhood will be founded in Dublin, it is the crucible of the organisation. When Devoy joins the IRB, the IRB is relatively young. It's been founded in 1858, but the IRB is growing throughout Ireland. It's growing throughout Ireland at a massive pace. You have members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood who are enlisted in the British Army. You have members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood who are school teachers, who are shopkeepers, who are small farmers. You also have the sons of clergymen. You have many kind of figures in local communities who are advocating this idea of an independent Ireland, this idea of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, but they can't say anything about it because it's a secret conspiracy. Now, the numbers are quite large. John Devoy is a recruit around the mid 1860s. When Devoy joins the IRB, he joins it at a pivotal moment within the organization's history. The organization is on a war footing. The organization is ready to go to war and it's being funded by Irish America to do so. Irish Americans are providing the money for this great organization to expand throughout the country. They're providing support for it as well. You'll have regular Americans coming across the Atlantic Ocean to train Irishmen in the handling and the use of guns, to train them in drilling, to train them as part of a military. You also have a situation as well that the Irish Republican Brotherhood that Devoy has become a member of is really committed to this idea of a secular Ireland as well. And Devoy subscribes to this idea, the idea of an Ireland where, yes, you respect priests, you respect religious within the church context, but when they speak about politics, they're ordinary individuals and they deserve to be attacked politically for being so. In 1865, James Stevens is arrested. James Stevens is held in Richmond Bridewell in Dublin, which is the present day site of the Griffith College in Dublin. Now, James Stevens is only held briefly in Richmond Bridewell. The Fenians have determined that they're going to get this leader out. They're going to get the chief organiser of the Irish Republic out of jail. This man is a key figure within the history of the Fenian movement. He's the, the monumental leader. And for James Stevens to be rotting, in a British jail. This is a huge loss to the Fenian movement. It's also a propaganda coup if they get him out of the jail. So what the Fenians decide to do is, is that they're going to make a key. And they make a key using an an instrument maker called Michael Lambert. Michael Lambert will then smuggle the key into the building through two sympathetic jailers, who are called John Breslin and Daniel Byrne. And John Breslin and Daniel Byrne will spirit Stevens out of the building. When they spirit Stevens into the exercise yard of Richmond jail, there's a disaster. They can't get over the wall. As a result, they have to use some tables and they eventually get Stevens over the wall. When Stevens gets over the wall of Richmond Bridewell, Stevens falls into the arms of Colonel Thomas Kelly and John Devoy. And John Devoy is involved in spiriting James Stevens away from that prison. Now, in the aftermath of that escape, 
public billheads are put all across Dublin. James Stevens is the most wanted man within the country. Everyone is talking about James Stevens. There is a, everyone is talking about James Stevens. James Stevens is wanted dead or alive inside of Dublin City. They can't find him. Rumours are spreading all across the country. Stevens is in the north of the country. Stevens is spotted in Belfast. No, Stevens is in Cork. No, he's been spotted back in Kilkenny, his hometown. James Stevens has escaped. James Stevens turns up in New York City. The British can't touch him in New York City. John Devoy's role within the Irish Republican Brotherhood was chief organiser of the British Army and was a title that he himself detested, as you can possibly imagine from the title that he was given, chief organiser of the British Army. Devoy's role was essentially to meet Irishmen within the British Army and to turn them toward the Fenian cause. The idea was, as Devoy said himself, to appeal to their natural sense of patriotism. The whole plan was that when the inevitable rebellion would take place, the British Army soldiers, who were known as soldier Fenians, they would desert. They would leave the British Army and they would turn to the Fenian side, bringing their weapons and bringing their experience with them. Now, Devoy was one of the most remarkable recruiters within the British Army, uh, such as because of John Devoy's efforts within the British Army, an awful lot of men were recruited to the Fenian cause. Of those, who Devoy, of those who Devoy recruited, however, an awful lot of them were committed to an idea of an independent republic. And this is really personified by the lads who went to... Uh, and this is really personified by the soldier Fenians who were arrested and sent to Fremantle in Western Australia. These guys were all committed to the Fenian ideal. They're very strongly advocating this idea of an independent Irish republic. Many of the soldier Fenians are only British Army soldiers on the basis that it's a job. They're there to provide for the family. There's no loyalty to the crown per se. It's the only army that's there for them to join. The option is open for many others within Dublin to join the likes of the French army, as Devoy had done. But many, for many, it's just easier to join the British army. You get a good pay out of it. You get to see the world. You get to do a bit of travel. However, there's very little loyalty to the crown, and Devoy knows this. And having met and having spoken with a number of them, John Devoy understands their mentality and he appeals to their natural sense of patriotism. And he brings up stories of the revolutionary past. He brings up stories of British injustices within Ireland. And he essentially says to the soldier Fenians, the uniform that you're wearing, it's not the uniform of an Irish Republic. You should be wearing a uniform of an Irish Republic. And one day you will be wearing that uniform of an Irish Republic. But we need you. We need your assistance in this battle against British rule within Ireland. And he appeals to them quite successfully. And as a result of John Devoy's labours and John Devoy's activities, you can safely say there are thousands, thousands of Irishmen who are in the British army who are converted to the Fenian ambition of achieving an independent Irish Republic by force. And this leads us up to that great Fenian escape from Fremantle in Western Australia in the 1870s. In 1876, John Devoy masterminds the Catalpa escape from Fremantle in Western Australia. In the late 19th century, Fremantle in Western Australia was inescapable. It was regarded as the arsehole of the world. It was regarded as a place that no one could get out of. It was a prison complex that you didn't even need to imprison prisoners in because there was nowhere to escape from. There was nowhere to go. It was essentially Australia's Alcatraz of an institution. Many of the soldier Fenians had been sent to Western Australia. Of those who were sent to Western Australia, a number of letters were smuggled out to John Devoy. John Devoy received these letters in New York City. When he received the letters in New York City, he was so moved by these letters that he decided he had to do something for these men. He had to do something for these men who were a voice from the grave. And if you think of the language that is used in the let in the if you think of the language that is used in the letter by James Wilson, a voice from the grave, the whole idea is that these men are dead. These men are forgotten about. Devoy is responsible for putting these men into jail. It's Devoy's actions that recruits these men into a conspiracy that results in them being uprooted, being sent to one of the worst hellholes within the Western world. Devoy determines he has to do something, and Devoy organises a secret conspiracy to free and release these men. Now, John Devoy wants to go to Western Australia himself, but he decides he can't go to Western Australia himself. The reason being he's too famous, he's too known. So he decides that he's going to have an acolyte go in his place. And the best man to do so is the Liberator, a man called Johnny Breslin. Johnny Breslin is referred to as the Liberator within Fenian parlance as kind of a joke at the Daniel O'Connell title. It was Johnny Breslin uh, who secured the release of James Stevens in 1865. And he makes his way to Western Australia where he disguises himself as a millionaire and actually meets the governor of Fremantle Prison. And he gets a tour of Fremantle Prison where he's there 
where he's there masterminding this great escape from the prison complex. It's a huge undertaking to do, and the fact that no one knew about it was even more remarkable. Um, the British intelligence heard nothing of it. British intelligence knew nothing that there was going to be this Fremantle escape. Devoy had masterminded this conspiracy that had to go all across Cumann, uh, that Devoy had masterminded this conspiracy that had to go all across Clan Nguyen. It was all across the uh, eastern board of America. People in New York knew about it. People in New Jersey knew about it. People in Chicago knew about it. A lot of people knew about it when the Fenian movement. But bizarrely, no one talked. The British had no idea that this escape was going to take place. There, there's, there's one key informer at this stage called Henri Le Caron. Henri Le Caron had been 25 years in the British Secret Service. And he's, re he's revealed in... 1888, at the height of the Parnell Special Commission, Le Caron himself knew nothing about this. Now, Le Caron claims to have known a lot about this, but he knew nothing about it. And it was always something that John Devoy held quite dear to his heart, that the Irish people in America put the... The Irish people in America put the benefit of these men in Fremantle to the forefront, and they did not speak. Had one voice have spoken about this, then this whole entire conspiracy would have been undermined. Um, and at, at this period as well, I suppose, in, in, in 1876, at this period, at the time of the Catulpa escape, Devoy is having a personal conflict with Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa. Rossa had established a skirmishing fund, and the idea of the skirmishing fund was to lead a dynamiting campaign against Britain. Devoy couldn't comprehend why O'Donovan Rossa wanted to tell the world that they were, he was going to lead a skirmishing campaign. He couldn't comprehend why skirmishing was even the name of this fund. And Devoy secured the control of the fund from O'Donovan Rossa. Devoy as a character is quite ruthless. What Devoy wants is an independent Ireland. What Devoy wants is an independent Ireland. Devoy wants to break the connection between Britain and Ireland. And anything that gets in his way, he's willing to walk over it. He's a ruthless individual. At this stage, O'Donovan Rossa has lost his business. O'Donovan Rossa has also lost two children. And he's increasingly turned to alcohol abuse. John Devoy uses this to oust O'Donovan Rossa from the skirmishing fund. Now, the two men were incredibly strong friends. In 1876, 1877, they fell out. They want nothing to do with each other. They grow to hate each other. They grow to detest each other. And it's only in 1913 that the two men will actually make up, that the two men will again speak to each other. In, in, in his book, what DeVoy says, um, DeVoy says he opposed dynamite. John DeVoy supported dynamite. He's very vocal in his support of dynamite. In all the primary documents... Oh, he did. In all the primary documents as well, he's talking about how we need to have a dynamiting campaign in Britain. Now, in 1884, there's a Fenian called John Daly, who's very close to John Devoy and later to Tom Clark, who himself is a dynamitard. And John Daly is arrested in April 1884 in Birkenhead train station with grenades in his pockets. These grenades had been given to John Daly to th be thrown from the visitors gallery of the British House of Commons while the British government was in session. The whole idea was to assassinate the British government. The grenades had been purchased in America by John Devoy and John Breslin. They were then given to um, a transatlantic steamer, to a fireman aboard a transatlantic steamer who would then deliver them to an, to an intermediary. And this intermediary, unfortunately, was a British agent. You can cut out, unfortunately, in that sense, because it sounds like I support the assassination of the British government. But um, at the time of this John Daly, at the time of the John Daly conspiracy, when Daly was arrested, British intelligence had referred to John Devoy as the most dangerous enemy of Great Britain. He was the most dangerous man in America, according to Edward George Jenkinson, who was the head of the Secret Service in the 1880s. Um, we go back a wee bit and just uh, there was a planned IRB uprising. Mm -hmm. In 1866 or 65? Um, 65 and then 66 yeah. again, yeah. 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 So, what went wrong? How come that never happened? Okay. Um, in, the, in the Irish People newspaper offices in 12 Parliament Street in Dublin, there's an informer. The informer is called Pierce Nagel. Pierce Nagel has discovered amongst the papers of the Irish people a letter from James Stevens saying that 1865 is going to be the year of action. Nagel, with this information in hand, goes straight to his handler, a man called Daniel Ryan. And Daniel Ryan belongs to the G Division of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. And with this information in hand, 
Ryan now authorises the suppression of the Irish People newspaper. And this essentially undermines the Fenian ability to have a rebellion in 1865. Now in 1865 you have the arrest of O'Donovan Rossa. You have the arrest of Charles Kickham. You have the arrest of uh, John O'Leary. You also have the arrest of Dennis Dowley Mulcahy and also James Stevens himself, who's taken to Richmond Bridewell Jail. John Devoy is absolutely horrified at this. John Devoy has been recruiting within the British Army. John Devoy sees that you have a situation where you have a very strong element in the British Army who are capable of defecting, bringing their guns with them toward the cause of an independent Ireland. John Devoy, however, now sees and very strongly argues that the Fenian executive is now gone. It's now on its knees. Devoy argues that something needs to be done very quickly. But unfortunately, Devoy finds that those who are in the IRB, particularly after the escape of James Stevens, don't really think that the time is right to have a rebellion. They believe because of the suppression of the Irish People newspaper, the time has passed, that we need to take our time, we need to hold on to our powder, and we need to wait for the next available opportunity. John Devoy is arrested in 1866 at Pillsworth's pub in James Street in Dublin. When he's arrested, he's arrested in the company of a number of British Army soldiers, and he's taken immediately to prison. With Devoy's arrest, you lose one of the most important activists within the Fenian movement. Between 1865 to 1866, far too many good individuals have been arrested within the IRB. The leadership cadre of that organisation are now in jail or they're in exile. They've escaped from the country. You have a situation that, that undermines the ability of the Irish Republican Brotherhood to actively lead a rebellion in the forthcoming year in 1867. There's no leadership there in 1867. Uh, the IRB leadership are really running on a haphazard plan. The plan they have involves a degree of guerrilla warfare and it involves a degree of skirmishes, but they're undermined by a lack of leadership. They're undermined by poor planning and they're also undermined by incredibly bad weather. They're undermined by an awful lot of snow that stops people generally from coming out in the day as well. In 1871, John Devoy is released from prison with Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, Henry Melida, John McClure and Charles Underwood O'Connell. These men now become known as the Cuba Five because they board a transatlantic steamer called the Cuba. Now, the conditions of their release are quite problematic for the Fenians and for the Cuba Five themselves. The conditions of the release were that for the duration of your sentence, you can never come home. For the duration of your sentence, you must choose a life in exile. The Cuba Five choose America. They believe that in America, you have the free air of the American Republic. You have a situation where the British government can't touch you in America. You can remain active within Fenian politics. While they're there, while they're traveling across the Atlantic on the steamer Cuba, John Devoy actually teaches O'Donovan Rossa how to play poker. Devoy recalled that Rossa became quite a good poker player and he made an awful lot of money on that trip. In some correspondence that's there in the archives, Devoy actually indicates that he believed that Rossa was joking, that he couldn't play poker, that Rossa was a bit of a poker shark within that sense. Now, when they arrive in America in 1871, there's a circus. The Americans want to be associated with the Cuba Five. Uh, you have Tammany Hall, who are rushing to see the Cuba Five. You have the Democratic Party, who are associated with Tammany, Tammany Hall, who want to see the Cuba Five. The US Republican Party really want to be associated with them. You have Irish-American organisations. There's literally a charge of boats that are charging out to see the Cuba Five. When the Cuba Five come into America, they're greeted to an almost celebrity-like status. O'Donovan Rossa recalled that he shook so many hands that his hand was quite sore. Now, when they arrive into America, no one really knows John Devoy. Everyone wants to talk to O'Donovan Rossa. Rossa is the man that they all know about, largely as a result of his prison experiences. Devoy is very much so the back room man. However, John Devoy advances very rapidly within Irish-American politics and Irish-American life. He joins this revolutionary organisation that's really taken shape in Irish America in the aftermath of the Fenian Rebellion. And this organisation is called Clan Maguile. It's also known as the United Brotherhood. And this is a secret revolutionary conspiracy. It's very Masonic within a lot of its rules and rituals. And John Devoy found that to be quite painful to have to join a Masonic organisation. Uh, he recalled in his recollections that many of their initiation rituals were scandalous and he fought very strongly to have them removed. Devoy will become the president of that organisation and he'll become one of the most dominant figures within that organisation. And by the end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century, John Devoy is probably the most famous Irish-American associated with that organisation with Clan Maguile. And Devoy very much so is important in terms of every single revolutionary movement in Irish history from the late 18th onwards to the early 20th century. 
Well, Irish America. Irish America was in disarray when he got there. Uh, the Cuba Five and the Exos that followed them, they tried to unite Irish America behind the Exos. They set up this umbrella organization that's called the Irish Confederation. The ambition is to unite all of Irish America behind this broad program to achieve an independent Ireland. It's another failure. It's a failure because the Fenian Brotherhood oppose it. But upon their arrival in 1871 to America, they joined Clan the Gael. Now, Clan the Gael had been founded um, in New York City, and this Clan the Gael was different to any other Irish revolutionary organisation that had come before it. This Clan the Gael was essentially a secret, oath-bound society. It was devoted to achieving an independent Ireland. Now, Clan the Gael's plan was to fund the movement at home, was to fund the Irish Republican Brotherhood. But in the 1870s, in the aftermath of the Fenian Rebellion in 1867, there's an increasing recognition within Clan the Gael that the Americans need to use their position to advance the cause of Ireland. They need to be a little bit more proactive in terms of advancing the cause of Ireland. And John Devoy is one of the key figures in making this argument about how they need to be proactive in advancing the cause of Ireland. Yeah, because that is one thing that uh, strikes you when you're looking at the 1900s in uh Irish history is the, is the the influence that Irish America mm. had over Republican politics here in in Ireland. Right? Yeah. British intelligence, they refer to Irish America as providing the gold for the Fenian movement. They, they're they providing the gold for the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Without Irish America, you couldn't possibly have the movement back home. The movement back home, the Irish Republican Brotherhood needs Clan the Gael. They need the money that's coming from America. If you think what America is, first of all, America is away. It's so far away from the British jurisdiction. The British cannot touch them. In America, you have an American sense of republicanism. And this American sense of republicanism favours an idea of citizenship, that you have the right to bear arms. And where you see tyranny, you must resist that tyranny. And any means possible at your disposal within the American Republican narrative, where you see tyranny, it is justifiable to use any means possible to undermine and defeat that tyranny. Now, an awful lot of the Fenians in America, including John Devoy, increasingly make the argument that America is the first republic. And as the first republic in the world, it is the duty of Irishmen in America to spread that republic back to Ireland, to spread the ideals of American republicanism back home. And they increasingly tie the Irish question to the American question. You also have a situation that the Irishness of many Irish people in America is used against them. The Irishness of many Irish Americans uh, is seen as backward. They're seen as superstitious. They're seen as dirty. There's a race to the bottom between Irish Americans and African Americans. Now, many Irish Americans harbour this great hatred. Many Irish Americans harbour this great hatred of British rule within Ireland, largely on the basis of their condition within America. There's also an Irish American nationalism that's underlooked within the Fenian movement. Many argue that. They're, they're looked down upon in America because the British won't give them their home. They're looked down upon in America because they don't have an independent country. They don't have a country that's willing to advance themselves or they're not allowed to actually have their own community within their own country. And many Irish Americans put the blame of their lives in America at the foot of the British government. And many of them are willing to have revenge against the British government for this. And this is one of the reasons why you have so many donations to a skirmishing fund in the 1870s, a skirmishing fund that was set up specifically to fund bombings against Britain, that Devoy himself is initially quite supportive of. The relationship that John Devoy had with Tom Clark in the 1880s will be patchy. Of the relationship we know he had, we know that Clark joined Clan the Gael. He joined the premier Clan the Gael club in New York City. Um, in this Clan the Gael club, he became associated with a man called Dr. Thomas Gallagher. And through this, he'd be involved in the dynamiting campaign in the 1880s. Clark would be involved in a dynamite cell that rather ambitiously plans to blow up Big Ben Clock Tower in central London and the very seat of the British Parliament itself, Westminster Palace. Now, for this, he's imprisoned for a lifetime imprisonment. He does 15 years in rather terrible conditions. When he's released, he returns back to Ireland. He finds that he can't get a job in Ireland because of his background. He decides he's going to go to America, where he associates with John Devoy. And there's a very strong friendship between himself and Devoy in the uh, late 18th, early 20th century. Devoy sends Thomas James Clark back to Ireland because Devoy doesn't trust anyone back home. Devoy doesn't trust the Supreme Council. Devoy argues that he will not work with anyone except Clark, and he has Clark put on the Supreme Council as the treasurer of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And having put Clark 
on that Supreme Council as the treasurer of that organisation. This now sets in motion a chain of events that will culminate in the forthcoming Easter Rebellion of 1916. Like Devoy argued the Supreme Council in Dublin were just amateurs, that Tom Clark was a proper revolutionary and Tom Clark was the man that he would deal with. Um, also, John Devoy was quite an austere revolutionary. He was a figure that there was no nonsense with him. It was literally a tra one track mind toward revolution. Clark was quite similar. Clark was a revolutionary in the mould of John Devoy or Donovan Rossa. He was an individual who wanted an Irish Republic, and again, another ruthless individual. If anything got in his way of achieving that Irish Republic, it had to be eliminated. It couldn't get in the way of doing so. When O'Donovan Ross had died in June 1915, Thomas James Clark is cabled by John Devoy to tell him that Ross is dead. And Devoy asks him essentially, what do we do? Thomas Clark's response back is send his body home at once. Now John Devoy arranges that O'Donovan Ross's body will be sent home. Devoy believes that a funeral of O'Donovan Ross in Dublin is going to be a great centerpiece. It's going to be a pre-revolutionary act. And this funeral in Dublin City is going to be the fourth this funeral in Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin is going to be the justification for this pre-revolutionary moment of Irish history. It's going to be the justification for the forthcoming rebellion. Now, Thomas James Clark will organise, he will mastermind the funeral in Dublin City. He's given money from America to purchase a grave for O'Donovan Rossa. And he purchased a grave for O'Donovan Rossa near enough to the O'Connell Crypt in what today is the Republican uh, Circle. What today is the Republican Circle? In what today is the Republican plot. plot. Thomas James Clark is given £20 from America. This £20 from America comes from Clan the Gael. It comes through John Devoy. And Thomas James Clark purchases a grave for O'Donovan Rossa in the Republican plot as we today know it. It's under the shadow of the Daniel O'Connell Memorial. Now, at this stage, there was a big controversy. Many people wanted O'Donovan Rossa to have a great headstone, to mark this great unrepentant Fenian in Irish history. There was a big argument that the Maid of Erin monument over the grave of John O'Mahony and Terence Bellow McManus in Glasnevin Cemetery, that this should in fact be put over the grave of O'Donovan Rossa. John Devoy was against that. John Devoy argued very, very strongly, to quote John Devoy, O'Donovan Rossa does not need a monument. The only monument that O'Donovan Rossa needs is an independent Ireland. John Devoy is central to the Easter Rising of 1916. Devoy is the man who is providing money for this organisation to lead the Easter Rebellion of 1916. Devoy has been underwritten within the history of the Easter Rising. One of his enemies within America was also a Fenian. His enemy was called Patrick Egan. Now, Patrick Egan had formerly been the treasurer to the Land League. He'd also been a member of the Irish National Invincibles, who famously assassinated Cavendish and Burke in the Phoenix Park in 1882. And Egan famously denounced John Devoy in the aftermath of the Rising in the strongest terms possible, when he announced through a newspaper in America that if anyone deserved to be shot for their role within the Easter Rising of 1916, it was John Devoy. Devoy is as much a part and a figure within that great rebellion in Irish history as the likes of Patrick Pierce. But Devoy scandalously has been written out of Irish history in the reference to the Easter Rebellion. It, do you think it could have happened without him? No. The Easter Rising would not have happened without John Devoy. The Easter Rising couldn't have happened without John Devoy. John Devoy is a great, important figure within Irish history. Devoy is providing the money, he's providing the support, he's providing the ambition toward this rebellion. Devoy and Thomas James Clark have a relationship. This relationship that they have is the driving force behind the Easter Rising. These two individuals have come together, and these two individuals have come together to assemble more or less a team to lead for this rebellion, to lead this revolution within Irish history. They genuinely believe that a rebellion must take place during the course of the First World War. John Devoy very strongly believes that this is Britain's difficulty. Britain's difficulty has come. And if we allow this opportunity to pass without doing something, then we will never do anything. And John Devoy really pushes this idea of an Irish Republic. And Devoy throughout his life, Devoy represents something that very few Fenians represent within Irish history. Uh, he's only rivaled by O'Donovan Rossa in this respect. Devoy represents all the themes inherent within Irish history. He represents a revolutionary theme. He represents a theme of exile. He represents a theme of an exile who is using his 
authority within America to push forward this idea of an independent Ireland, of breaking the connection with Great Britain. And this is really graphically represented in a photograph in the Waldorf Hotel in 1919. Raymond de Valera, the president of the Irish Republic, in a photograph had tried to show the passing of the torch the passing of the torch from the great Fenian generation to the new generation in this famous photograph where he touches John Devoy on the shoulder. Devoy hated De Valera. And in that photograph, you can actually see the hatred in Devoy's face for De Valera. <laughs> 